I want to welcome you to the fourth annual luncheon with Corley Florida and GLBX. Equality means business. Our first rule of business is we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag and the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You have a seat. I just a quick reminder before you leave today to get your ticket for the parking stamped. It um, gives us a reduced pricing. So just, just I want to tell you that up front early before I forget. All right, so get your ticket stamped. We normally, at this point, we do self-introductions. But because of the extensive program we have, we have about six speakers. We are going to actually skip introductions today. I'm encouraging you to go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone at your table. Um, and if you haven't met anyone new tonight, today, this evening, make sure you get a chance to do that before you leave. Um, someone you can do business with. With that note, what I want to do is go ahead. We have the pleasure actually today, our president and CEO from the chamber, Dan Limblade is here. I'm going to give him a few minutes <laughs> just to say a few words. And she just loved that, Dan. Thanks, you, Karen. <laughs> I have some salad in my mouth, so I'll move on. It caught me by surprise there. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. I just got back into town, and I was at my nephew's wedding up in Pennsylvania, in uh, Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, Amish country. And I got to tell you that it was hot up there, and it was it was hot, a lot hotter than it was here. Uh, but I'm glad to be back. Uh, middle of summer. We're in our summer sizzle campaign for membership. Hopefully you've all heard about that and you're referring people to get yourself in for those prizes. It really is though, Karen, a, 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 an honor to be here. I missed last year's uh, lunch. Uh, but for me to be here and listen to the great speakers you have lined up to talk about something very important to us here in South Florida, in the United States for that matter, and in the world, and that's equality for everyone. And so I'm pleased that this chamber was the first chamber to be the full service chamber, <clears throat> pardon me, to incorporate the GLBX Council in the state of Florida. I don't know if any of you know that, but when Mark Budwig came to me about uh, seven years ago and said, Dan, what would you think about creating a gay and lesbian council? And I said, is there a need for that? And he said, yeah, I think so. And I said, one thing, I said, as long as it doesn't be an island in and unto itself. And I got to tell you, the GLBX Council at the Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber of Commerce has been one of our best, most active, thriving, incorporating councils in the chamber. So I think the GLBX Council deserves a round of applause. Switch gears real quick. A couple of big things coming up for us. Uh, we have a sales tax referendum that we're going to be voting on in the fall. In November, you'll be asked to approve or not approve two ballot questions, one for a half a penny for infrastructure and another half a penny for transportation. If you vote no on either one, they both go down. So look for that because transportation and infrastructure You've all lived here. You know what it's like. We need the money to provide the better services so you all can get around and to keep from those pipes bursting that you know you've read about. Uh, we have a lot of backlog in infrastructure needs in our communities. 1.8 million people. You know, for those 1.8 million people, by 2030, we have to create 72,000 net new jobs just to keep our unemployment where it is right now at 4.1 percent, the lowest unemployment in the major metropolitan areas in the state of Florida. So I think that deserves a round of applause for us driving the economy. 
I could go on and on and on about all the programs, products, and services. We got another great program coming up with GLBX, our Artopia event coming up in September. And I'm sure Karen, you'll talk about that. But I just want to congratulate you all for being here. Wish you all a happy rest of the summer. And let's finish this year strong. Karen, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. As you mentioned, Utopia, I'll go ahead and throw it out there so we can put it on our date. Save your calendar. Save this date. September 24th, it's going to be at the NSS, NSU Museum on Los Olas for the second year. And we're looking forward to another great event. We're taking it up a notch. So put it on your calendar from now. Take your phones out. This is one time you can take your phone out and put that date in there. September 24th, 7 p.m. at the NSU Museum. You also will see um, you'll see this on your table. Excuse me here. LGBTQ dynamics in the workplace, Equality Florida and GLBX going to be putting a workshop together. Um, sometime in January, towards the end of January. So look forward to this. If you're interested in wanting to sponsor or to help make this a very successful event, go ahead and fill the information out and turn it in um, to one of the board members and I'll have them stand a minute. Any board members that are here, can you please stand? We got I also want to recognize the, uh, the Equality Florida staff members. Do we have any staff for Equality Florida? Can you please stand so we can recognize you, please? And last but not least, we can not recognize the chamber staff. Chamber staff, Carolyn, you here, Doug. Carolyn is like, everybody knows me. I'm just going to wave. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. With a great event, we have sponsors. And to this evening, our sponsor is no other than Fisher Phillips, uh, who's the, the Chamber's um, Council. And we're so honored for her to sponsor this event for us today. She actually reached out to us, wanting to do something with GLBX. So, Susan. Bogan, did I get your last name right? You did. You come on up and say a few words. Thank you. Okay, I guess it's the pink one. Okay. Hi, I am Suzanne Bogdan, and the name, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, is it this one? Yeah. Uh -huh. Both? Okay. Um, Maybe not for long. Okay, let me try this again. Is that better? Get a little closer. Okay, I'll pull this a little closer. How's that? Yay. Okay, excellent. All right, I'm Suzanne Bogdan. I'm with the law firm of Fisher and Phillips, and we are a very proud sponsor of today's luncheon. We did actually seek out through Karen to see if there was something that we could do together with GLBX, and I was thrilled when she told us that this luncheon was going to be available because it's something that's obviously right in our wheelhouse. Fisher and Phillips has 33 offices nationwide, and what we do is workplace law. We represent all all types of employers, small, medium, and large, and, and we counsel them on what their obligations and rights are as it relates to workplace issues. And obviously, over the last several years, some of the big issues have been issues pertaining to diversity and LGBT. So a little bit later today, we'll talk about where the law is today and kind of the areas that it's in flux and what you and we can do to help to make some positive of changes in the law. So thank you very much, Karen, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. Fisher Phillips. Without further ado, we have um, a lot of great speakers today. And we are so fortunate to have Stratton from Equality Florida, 
Stratton is the deputy, deputy director of Equality Florida, and he also is a co-founder of Equality Florida. He's actually going to be moderating um, today's event, and he's, he's going to come up and explain the process, because as you probably see, the speakers are not up here, so he's going to be bringing them up um, probably one at a time to talk, or two at a time, and he'll explain that process. Please put your hand together for Stratton, Paul, Thank you, Karen, and, um, and GLBX and Greater Fort Lauderdale Chamber for hosting us here. Um, this isn't actually on, is it? They are? No. This, this one seems to work a little better. All right. Um, so we're thrilled to be here. As most folks in this room know, the business community, we think, is absolutely central to the mission of achieving equality and acceptance, um, I hope that's not my phone, um, across Florida. And you know, we got a really powerful reminder of that in the wake of the horrendous Pulse massacre last month. And you know, I know it's been a challenging month for many of us, the emotions and just trying to figure out what it meant. It seems like as soon as we get our feet under us, there's another tragedy for us to process. But one of the things that we made as a commitment, the moment that happened, the morning as the news broke, was that we would stand with the victims and raise the resources to provide support for the families of victims and the survivors. And the business community leaned in with us. And the number of companies that have made 10000 25000 $50,000 contributions, not, most of which you haven't even heard of yet. They haven't been published, but they contributed mightily towards our Victims Fund that now has received over 120,000 donations from 130 countries, totaling $7.3 million. And that is So I just, you know, I want to say a big thank you to the business community because if anyone ever doubted that corporate America has been at the forefront of the struggle for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender equality, that was just another exclamation point that you're with us. So thank you for that. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to have a number of, as you've heard, really exciting speakers. And we're all going to give brief presentations, and then we're going to open it up for questions at the end and pass a microphone around as you have questions. So be thinking as you hear from folks if you have a, a question for one of our speakers. I just want to set the table by talking a little about Equality Means Business, the program that we're here to um, share a little more about today. So we, we formed this program um, about six years ago out of a recognition that the business community was at the front of this struggle and out of a desire to spotlight the companies in our state that really were um, standing with us in terms of their policies of diversity and inclusion. And we wanted to lift them up and, and to share with everyone why corporate America is doing this in companies large and small. And I think folks in the room understand that there really are two driving factors behind a company's decision to embrace diversity in this way. One is it's the right thing to do, right? And it just demonstrates that company's value. It's a moral value. It's an ethical value. But the other is that it is good for business, that if you want to attract and retain top talent, you want to show that you are embracing and welcoming of everyone. If you want um, to attract a client pool you know, across the spectrum, you want to make sure that your doors have that big welcome mat out front. And so what began as a small project has become really perhaps the largest project at Equality Florida. And today, 59 of our state's largest employers, including some of our major educational institutions and chambers of commerce, have joined our Equality Means Business program. And over 1,400 small businesses have joined the sister program, Another Business for Equality. If you're not sure if your small or large company is a part of this yet and you'd like to be, 
There's no charge to be involved in this program, so just talk to me or any member of our staff afterwards to make sure that, that you're in on this action, because we need you. Um, we've got a tremendous team, but it, it, it can only grow from here. We've all seen this year the price that states pay when they enact anti-LGBT policies, when they say to the world that they they value the opposite, right? We, we saw it in Indiana when they passed um, a statewide bill that basically permitted companies to discriminate against the LGBT community. Um, and then we saw it with great clarity this year when North Carolina passed what is becoming a truly infamous bill. And we saw the economic cost to those states' reputations immediately, you know, in the obvious forms of canceled conventions and concerts and companies refusing to expand into those areas because they didn't want to be associated. But the hidden costs of folks who have chosen not to travel or who have moved their families away, those are going to be reverberating through those states for a long time. We came pretty close in Florida to passing similar style legislation this year where there was a concern that a bill moving through our legislature was going to be expanded to include broad exemptions for discrimination. And it really was, again, the voices of the business community and folks here seeing what had happened in Orlando and being a little more organized and ahead of the curve that we were able to neutralize that effort and prevent Florida from following North Carolina and Indiana off of that cliff. So I think we should be very proud of that. But it's not enough to stop the bad stuff. We know here in Broward County and in South Florida and in most of our metropolitan areas across the state, we have protections from discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in place in our local policies, but we lack a state law. And that means there is a patchwork of uncertainty as people move around our state about whether you're protected and whether you're not. And last year, in partnership with our fund, we commissioned an intense research paper that showed that the cost to Florida every year of not having those statewide protections, and this is a very conservative estimate, is $362 million a year in lost revenue in money companies spend retraining people because it increases employee turnover when there is this instability that a lack of protections creates. So we know that we've still got some important work to do here in our state, but we're also truly thrilled to see the progress that we're making, and so much of it has been because of the leadership of the business community. And I, I did just want to share this, this quote, uh, and I want to get it just right. I was working on this in the car because I think it's really important as we think about why we value diversity. And I, I think, and I want, to, I want to speak to our young people when I say that we value diversity because we want our children to know that the only limit to your accomplishments is the strength of your dreams and your willingness to work for them. <laughs> Sorry about that inside joke, but we'll get you, we'll, we'll get you with that one in just a little bit. So without further ado, um, if you don't know who I'm quoting, take your pick. Um, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our first panelist um, who leads Equality Florida's Transgender Inclusion Project. As many of you have seen, the rise in anti-LGBT rhetoric that we have seen across the country in the last year has really specifically targeted the transgender community. And we are so fortunate to have, be able to have the resources to run an entire program at Equality Florida specifically dedicated to public education and expanding protections for the transgender community. And we have got a legend of a leader in um, the person running that program. Please join me in welcoming Gina Duncan. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I, I was just at a conference out in Portland, Oregon, and I think for the first time in my life, I was called a legend at that conference. And, being, and I don't know if that's a good thing or not. It, I don't feel old enough to be a legend, but uh, I'll take it. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I did write my speech myself. 
with a little help from someone, but just <laughs> put them bum mic drop, right? Let me first update you in reference to what's going on with our transgender inclusion initiative that I'm so proud to head up. You know, we, we started this two and a half years ago, and it couldn't have been more insightful for us to do it at that time. Because as you know, over the last two and a half years, our community has absolutely stepped out of the shadows and is vibrant and visible and making a difference for good and for bad in the fact that with every step up, there is pushback. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about this morning. You know, in forming TransAction, our Transgender Inclusion Initiative, we formed an advisory council from all over the state. And at this point, it's grown to where we have over 30 TransAction Advisory Council members spanning from South Miami to Pensacola to Jacksonville to St. Pete. And we found these advocates to be especially effective in not only pushing for local ordinances, and I'm proud to say, and you might already know this number, but at this point we have helped to pass human rights ordinances across the state to where currently more than 57% of the population of the state of Florida is protected against discrimination in the areas of housing, employment, and public accommodations. So good stuff. Transaction has been a large part of that, but it has also been directly due to the support of our business community. Everyone agrees on one thing, economic development and jobs. And in working with our business partners, this has been an integral part of not only passing these human rights ordinances, but continuing to push for Florida's Competitive Workforce Act. Part of that is education. And we see that employers across the state are seeing that, as Stratton pointed out, that it is indeed a competitive business advantage to have a complete and comprehensive diversity platform. And part of that is the Transgender Inclusion Initiative. Um, we are doing transgender inclusion trainings all over the state and frankly all over the country. I was invited actually to Milan, Italy to do an economic and development uh, workshop for the, Howard, for the Harvey Milk Foundation, which was a really tough gig to go to Milan, but it was, I forced myself to do it. But at this point, we've done over 50 workshops across the state, and our business leaders are seeing that that's an inclusive and comprehensive and important part of having a solid diversity platform. You know, our community, even though we're, we're stepping out of the shadows and people are feeling more and more able to be their true selves in safe places, it's no doubt that the community is under attack. And we see this in all intersections of our communities, in our school boards. We're seeing that our young people are being harassed and bullied. And we're seeing the violence that is going on against our transgender women of color all across the world and across the United States. As of this past week, 15 transgender women of color have been murdered. Last year, a transgender woman was murdered somewhere in the world every three days. So we have work to do. You know, discrimination and violence is something that is no stranger to our community, but working together, we can overcome that. And part of that is eliminating discrimination in all its forms. We can educate, we can make people aware, we can be visible advocates, but we must work together to eliminate discrimination, which leads to the hateful rhetoric, which then in turn leads to violence. And that's where we can all partner and join arm in arm in moving forward on the Florida Competitive Workforce Act. Part of our action moving forward is to do just that, is to educate and to make people aware of the fully inclusive capabilities that Equality Florida can do to support all of our business partners in moving forward on this. 
We're so pleased that you're here today. We're so pleased to have worked with you in all of the strides that we've made in Florida so far. There is still work to be done, but together we can truly get it done and we can honor the victims of Pulse with our actions to complete eliminating discrimination in the state of Florida. Thank you. The world is changing so quickly in terms of our understanding of transgender issues. And I just want to share with you all, because I'm fresh from Tampa, how exciting the pace of change is in Florida. As many of you know, Equality Florida has launched a statewide safe schools initiative. Uh, it's going to be headed by Dee Palazzo from here in Broward County, who's amazing. So just yesterday morning, Dee was in Hillsborough County, where there was a required training with one specific purpose, which was to train on transgender issues in the school setting. And it was required of every single elementary, middle school, and high school principal, assistant principal, and area leader. And it was opened, 425 school leaders came together just for this for two and a half hours at an event opened by the superintendent and the school district attorney. That's, that's the kind of public education we're seeing that's going to change hearts and minds. This work is truly nonpartisan work. It really is. And we are so fortunate to have champions on both sides of the aisle. And the person I'm going to introduce next was really there for us in Tallahassee last year when for the first time, not just in Florida, but for the first time in the southern United States, an LGBT non-discrimination bill achieved a hearing, a hearing in our state government. And it achieved that um, because the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee insisted that this needed to be debated. And although the bill went down in a five to five tie, we had folks on both sides of the aisle standing with us. And we're so very proud to have with us at our luncheon today, Senator Miguel Diaz de la Portilla. <laughs> Senator Diaz. Well, th thank you very much. It's, uh, it's tough to follow a legend. <laughs> so, um, and my remarks uh, weren't written by anybody. In fact, I haven't even written them myself. I'm going to just speak extemporaneously and, and, and speak from the heart. Um, I think anybody who uh, lives, uh, who's around these days and watches what's going on in the news, whether it's the uh, terrible attacks at Pulse, what happened in Nice, France, and what happens and what has been happening in, in our world, has to, to, to realize that we all have to do something to fight against hate and to fight against ignorance. I think that most of the actions that we see or hate-inspired actions stem from ignorance. Ignorance and fear. Fear of what other people are like, what other cultures are like. And so we have to do everything, those of us who are in a position to influence others that we can to fight against ignorance and fight against hatred and fight against fear. I think it's imperative for the state of Florida to adopt the Competitive Workforce Act. And I'm here today to commit to you that I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that that is the law in the state of Florida in 2017. We did achieve a hearing, actually two hearings, uh, this past session. I placed it on the agenda for a hearing, and we had a 5-5 tie. And then through what I call, for lack of a better term, some procedural magic, we were able to bring it back for a hearing the next day and press the issue of how important it is to get this piece of legislation passed in the state of Florida. The uh, bill received bipartisan support because this isn't about Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, or anything else. This is about human dignity. This is about human rights. This is about doing what's right. And people of all parties, of all political affiliations, should be supportive of the Competitive Workforce Act because it's the right thing to do, period. Yes, it's good for business. Yes, 
businesses that are inclusive are successful businesses. Yes, states that are open to people, regardless of their sexual orientation, are successful states. But it isn't because it's good for business <clears throat> or because it creates a broader tax base or employment opportunities that this bill is important. It's important because it's the right thing to do. And we need to do what's right, and we need to stand up for what's right, and we need to stand up against ignorance. So working together with Equality Florida and all of you in this room, I think we need to have a strong push next year in Tallahassee. It's not enough that we had one hearing or two hearings. We need to make sure that this gets to the floor of the Florida Senate, and I'll do everything that I can, and I'll be in a good position, hopefully, God willing, to be able to do that in a leadership position, to be able to make sure that the bill goes to the floor of the Senate and passes out of the floor of the Senate. And there's work to be done in the House. There's a lot of work to be done in the House. But I feel very, very, very confident that we're going to be able to get the Competitive Workforce Act adopted next year's law. And it's ta sad and it's terrible that sometimes tragedy, the unspeakable tragedies that have gone on in the world, you know, happen. And, but sometimes when that happens, it brings people together. It motivates people to look deep inside their souls and their hearts to stand up for what is right, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how much political opposition they may receive from certain interest groups if they do so. Passing this bill next year will make sure that those who died this year to acts of hate, hatred, of bigotry, of violence did not die in vain. That those of us who are around in a position to do something about hatred and bigotry and discrimination are going to stand up against hatred, bigotry, and discrimination. So you have my commitment that I'll be on the forefront of that fight for what is right, for justice, for all people who live in the state of Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I, I cannot tell you how refreshing it is to hear Republican elected officials like yourself speak with such clarity about discrimination. As many folks know, the, the House lead sponsor of this bill, Holly Rashine, is also a Republican, truly a bipartisan issue. Uh, our next speaker um, comes to us from PNC Bank, and PNC has been an incredible advocate for equality in the workplace, scoring 100% for many years on HRC's Corporate Equality Index. But they've also been a tremendous backer of our work to end discrimination here in Florida. We've just received news in the last week that PNC is renewing their support at the $50,000 level as Equality Florida's statewide presenting sponsor for the fourth year in a row, which is simply amazing. Please join me in welcoming Senior Vice President, Regional Manager for South Florida, Fred Livingston. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My job is done, the speech is given, uh, but I am delighted to be here. You know, when I listened to the comments that were shared by the Senator and by Gina and others, and it talks about that company, I'm really proud to say that I work for that company. And you know, we talk the talk, but we walk the walk. We do it every day. And so I want to share a little bit about our story and how we got there. Because although PNC Bank is 150 years old, here we go with the plug, you ready? 150 years old, 2,700 branches, 57,000 employees. That's the plug. But we're really just a community bank. We're a Main Street bank that has a heart. And it's that heart that leads us to our connection to diversity, inclusion, and LGBT. The fact that I'm a corporate executive with PNC Bank and I'm an openly gay man and married and all that other stuff is really irrelevant as far as I'm concerned because I'm not that political guy. But I am very committed to making sure that our team members know that when they come to work every day that they're allowed to bring themselves to work every day. I take it for granted. But I was in a meeting just the other, actually on Monday, 9 o'clock, and I'm having a conversation with one of our vice presidents up in Boca Raton. I need to be careful how I say this. Actually, I'm not going to say it. 
Um, but it was apparent, let me just point at them and say, it's that woman over there. Um, but it was apparent to me in that conversation that this person was not 100% comfortable in bringing their whole self to work. And I found that really startling. With all the work that we do as an organization, whatever we do every day, we still have so far to go. There are still far too many people that are afraid. And just before preparing to come over and speak with you all today, I was pulling up some information about the company and I just came across something that was just recently announced. And it came that we were recognized as one of the 100 companies by Affinity Incorporated Magazine for 2016 because of our commitment to LGBT empowerment. So I was kind of pumped. I'm like, I didn't even hear about this until I pulled it up. But it's, and it's not easy to get there. And the way that we got there as an organization is we're recognized because we have these things called EBRGs. You ever heard of them? Employee-based resource groups. It's a little confusing to me, but what it does is it means that we support the employee's right to get together and talk and work together and, and promote themselves. But it also means that we've committed to working with organization suppliers that are equally as committed to LGBT. But even with all those recognition, the opportunity continues for us to drive that message to all of our team members. So while I think we're making great strides, and we are, we have so much further to go. You've heard the comment a number of times today, we do this because it's not just a socially, socially responsible thing to do, it's a financially responsible thing to do as well. But we still have to continue to drive and, and share that message. You know, as, as a regional, I have the pleasure of corresponding and communicating with the market. But you know, have you ever come in and you had that letter sitting on your desk? and it says experience. And we're all branded on experience, but I want to read something to you that talks about us walking the walk. So give me a second because I'm now at that age. Jeez. Obviously the person who wrote this is a lot younger than I am. So here's how the letter reads. My experience, dear Mr. Livingston, greetings. As a transgender woman, male to female, who has experienced a great amount of discrimination throughout my life, I'm always concerned about the way I will be treated when going out into public. Many people treat transsexuality as a big joke. Thankfully, the social, through social awareness about transgenderism, things have gotten better. But transgender is not easy, it's challenging. I frequent, I frequent one of your branches regularly. I wrote a letter to you about a couple of years ago not to me, to the bank, but the excellent service that I received and I was compelled to write the letter again. I was compelled to do so because the customer service, the reception that I receive is always good. I'm always greeted with respect. I always get a big smile from the tellers and the team from within. You make me feel so comfortable and welcome. So when I think about LGBTNA, I think we've made some great progress but we still have so far to go. So the message that I would deliver, yes, it makes good sense. It's a message that you have to live every day. You have to walk the talk every single day in order to make it right uh, for the team members that have the voice and for the team members that don't have the voice. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for allowing, us to, or allowing me to be here today. And I'll turn it back over to Frank. Thank you, Fred. So we, Many of us have the good fortune of living here in South Florida where a lot of our institutions understand the importance of rolling out that welcome mat we've all been talking about. And in particular, how important the LGBT community is to our tourist industry. And here in Broward County, <laughs> we, have, we have tremendous leadership, um, which I have such respect for at this moment in particular. Please keep those on. Um, so please join me in welcoming from the Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, Senior Vice President Rudy Molinay. I'm sorry, Carla Molinay. Rudy's his brother. <laughs> Thank you, Stratton. Wow, now, all right, so you have to please, you should have glasses at your uh, place setting, so could you please put them on for us? And let's make sure we get selfies, we get pictures, right? And on the count of three, I want you to give me the best quality Florida and greater Fort Lauderdale hello sunny that you can give me on three. One, two, oh, you're all putting them on. This is wonderful. What a moment. Let's make sure we capture this. One, two, three. Hello, sunny. All right, good. Give yourselves a round of applause. I have also reached that certain age, although my wife says, why are you saying that? So these have to come off. 
uh, and I'm going to put on the other glasses that I need uh, to give you some remarks today. I did write my own speech. I did say I wouldn't make a political <laughs> joke, but I guess I did. No, I did write my own. Uh, I have a few comments to make. I have the privilege, really, of being with you all. I've been uh, with Equality Florida actually involved since day one in the last few years here locally when you started this initiative and it really gives me tremendous pleasure. My brother has threatened to uh, introduce me as has actually been very active in the LGBT community uh, dating back to 1980 when he was published in The Advocate uh, with an article called for any Cuban Americans in the room you might know that our abuela is a pretty important person and the article was called Abuela Can We Talk and it's when he came out to our abuela which was my, our grandmother maternally so that's uh, Rudy Volanay and he, he was Health Crisis Network down in Key West as a realtor uh, and has been very active in the LGBT community for years. Now, at the Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau, we have been active in this since 1996. Nikki Grossman, our retired CEO, really had the courage, and back then, believe me, you all know what I'm talking about, I'm sure, it was courage to do this in 1996. It was not the most popular thing. And I remember one story that I have to share that she had several hotel owners that called her and said, what business? Who are these folks? And really not some very nice comments. Well, it took about three months. And when the business, not only was it the right thing to do, but the business was coming in and they were missing out on it because they clearly were not part of that agenda. Kind of like that team member that you were describing, Fred, that isn't out yet to, to be their own self. They called her back and said, how can I get some of that business? You were right. So it's amazing what 20 years could do. But we've been lauded uh, at the Greater Fort Lauderdale CVB for quite a few accomplishments. I'm not going to get into all of them. But I will tell you that Richard Gray, our managing director, uh, is working closely with Equality Florida. He also has the privilege, really, of being the vice chair at the international level of the IGLTA, which is our friend John Tanzella. You might know the organization. The, for those that don't, it's the International Gay and Lesbian Travel Association. And Richard just was voted in vice chair in Cape Town, South Africa, where, believe it or not, he had the chance to sit down with Mr. Marriott, with Bill Marriott Jr and talk about LGBTQ for 40 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, it just worked out. He also was with Desmond Tutu and a few others. And the reason I bring that up is that the reach is important because, you know, Margaret Mead said many years ago that never doubt that a small group of concerned, thoughtful citizens can change the course of history. They're the only ones that can and the only ones that will. And as I heard the senator and the legend Gina Duncan and Fred and Stratton talk today, right, it came to me that in my 51 years of life, I cannot remember a moment and tell me if you can, let me see me after. But I cannot remember a moment in 51 years that it's been more important with literally now weekly and sometimes daily the things that are going on in this world. It's absolutely our responsibility to make this happen. So some of the things that we've been blessed with here is that you might or might not know that Greater Fort Lauderdale has been one of the most progressive counties in all of Florida for many years. Since 1998, in fact, Greater Fort Lauderdale has protected the rights of residents and visitors barring discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity or expression in employment, housing and lodging. And by the way, in 2012, the US Census named Greater Fort Lauderdale as the number one city in the U.S. with the highest same-sex concentration, second was Seattle and third San Francisco, so we're very proud of that. Also in 2012, and I heard the school board reference very well today, we became the first public school district in the entire nation to adopt a resolution to support LGBT History Month, so that was a big deal. And we're the number one destination in Florida, and we have the largest uh, LGBT community in the U.S. with hundreds and hundreds of LB LGBT, and we've added the Q, by the way, we're one of the first bureaus to do that in North America for questioning, right? So we've added the Q. So we like to be ahead of the curve. We're also, by the way, according to uh, our friend Tom Roth at CMI, Community Marketing Initiative, uh, based out of the West Coast of the U.S., we're the number one, seven LGBT community destination in the world. Our goal is to get to number one, and Richard Gray is working tirelessly on our behalf. He literally is on a plane about 35 weeks a year traveling to the different events to promote Greater Fort Lauderdale. I had the pleasure of being with him a year before last at ID, ITV Berlin, which is the largest travel show in the world. Well, the LGBT community now has its own pavilion, and that just happened two years ago. And that's where about 150,000 folks in the, meet, in the travel business get together. So that's a huge step for the, uh, for the business community here. We're also the world home to the first World AIDS Museum in Milt Wilton Manors, which some of you I know are very familiar with. We're very proud of that. And of course, we're home to the Pride Center at Equality Park. It's the seventh largest in the world and one of the largest. I saw Robert Boo here earlier, so I know he's happy that I'm going to reference that. And we're also home to the Sunshine Cathedral that has the second largest congregation in the US. So you can see that. And you're wondering, why is the tourism guy talking about this? Well, the reason the tourism guy is talking about these things is because these are the assets 
that make up the community, that then that's how you connect the dots, as my friend Roy Rogers from Butterfly World and many other things likes to say. You have to connect the dots. And that's how we connect it. We're also, by the way, we've been the world headquarters for IGLTA, as you know. Uh, 16 gay hotels here, the most of any destination in the US. And the events keep coming. I'm not going to get into any of them, all of them, because I'll miss some. But I can tell you that the transgender conference with Lexi D, we came and did a training uh, at the Riverside Hotel. And we had, we we're first of its kind, by the way, in the US. We had 100 partners from hotels, restaurants, attractions to actually talk about how you interact with the T in the LGBT community, which is transgender. And we're happy to tell you that that business, that conference that we still borrowed from Atlanta, it's never going back there, I promise you, if we have anything to do with it. I can tell you that. It doubled this year. That's coming now. So it's really incredible. It went up to 1,200 attendees. I mean, it's unbelievable. But let me tell you one other thing, if I could. We also had the pleasure on the group side of hosting the NGLCC, which is the National Gay and Lesbian uh, Chamber of Commerce Conference. And that was a huge success. And they've committed to come back. And then most recently, Richard was asked to speak at the United Nations. Uh, and this is a trans initiative, and it's a United Nations study that's happening. So we're getting out there. In fact, I was just with him. He apologizes he couldn't be here today, but he had another commitment, including polishing off his uh, PowerPoint presentation. He's going to speak on our behalf in Buenos Aires, Argentina, as part of this UN study for transgender. So I can tell you, and you can rest assured if you're not already, that our CVB, our Tourism Bureau, our destination marketing organization here in Greater Fort Lauderdale, is poised ready to roll. We did something in my 12 years in market. I was a hotel executive prior. One of my proudest days was when we got out there and we were one of the first, actually the only one at the time to endorse marriage equality. We put our name on that right away. And what we did is we launched an initiative. It was called Love is Love. How many remember that? Right? Color, right? Definitely a round of applause for Love is Love, right? Because love is love, right? I actually had the pleasure. This was really cool. I had the pleasure on the beach of being the officiant that day. And I ran into the same sex couple, two ladies, at Anthony's Coal Fire and They remembered me big time. And it was such a momentous occasion. But what we did, we took it one step further. It was an integrated campaign, two page color spread in the New York Times, not an inexpensive proposition. And then we culminated it exactly one month after the Supreme Court, here, this was ahead of the US Supreme Court, right? Announced. We did a love is love ceremony where we had 100 couples. And love is love, so it was same sex, opposite sex, it didn't matter. Nikki Grossman actually and Judge Mel Grossman, her husband of 47 years, renewed their vows. So we did wedding and renewal. It was one of my proudest moments in my whole career. We did it at the W Hotel. And you know, when you pay talent, it's always interesting what you're gonna get. And what we got was Lance Bass. You might remember him, former NSYNC, Dancing with the Stars, right? But we were lucky, I'll tell you because Michael Turchin's his husband from Miami Beach. And they were so gracious. Lance, our publicist, actually was trying to get him out of the event, and he stayed. And that night, he had come on the red eye, and then that night he was going to New York to do Lance Loves Michael, I think the show is, if, and it was the wedding. It was the broadcast of their wedding on the E! Network, I believe it was, that night. And he came, and he was amazing. Couple of things on the horizon. By the way, that same Love is Love, won the statewide award named after Henry Flagler, the Flagler Award. First time an LGBT program has won a Flagler. And it was best of show. So the entire, the top award you can win there is best of show for any initiative. First time ever that an LGBT program, in this case, Love is Love, won it in 2015, 2016. That's worth a round of applause. And then another thing that we just launched, first CVB to do this in the New York Times is Gay Families. And I actually had the pleasure of being at a photo shoot last week over there at uh, Dania Beach. And we did this, and some of the images that we're seeing there with the gay families and the children, it's, it's phenomenal. So that's, we're at the cutting edge there, and that's where we want to be. We're also, and have been for years, now some have followed, that's okay, imitation's the greatest form of flattery, but for years, we were the only CBB in the world, not just the country, that had a designated department. Because you see, we don't treat it as a niche market. We treat it as a market. Because at the end of the day, it's a vertical market, just like sports and, and uh, sports marketing just like groups and conventions, tourism sales to us, it's all equal. I guess I, it kind of worked, it's all equal. All right, that was supposed to be a joke, all right, good. I won't quit my day job. And if you say that I sound like Gilbert Gottfried, you're in trouble with me. But there might be some other guy that's on CBS that I might remind you of, hopefully that, but you can figure that who that is. 
All right, now, the last thing I want to tell you on the financial side, you got it, right? Ray Romano, yeah, I get it all the time. I actually played in a celebrity poker tournament with him in 2007 in Las Vegas. It was a hoot, two hours together. His brother is very funny, Brad Garrett. But anyway, final comment is this. If you thought that it didn't make business sense, let me just give you a feel, a flavor, in this last year, in 2015, record year for Greater Fort Lauderdale, by the way, fourth year in a row, over 15 million visitors. Of those 15 million visitors, 1.5 million were identified LGBTQ. And we know it's higher because you all know, as you said earlier, for some still do not want to identify, unfortunately, but we want to change that, certainly. So we know it's higher, but let's just go with the identified number, 1.5 million. They spent $1.5 billion. $1.5 billion would it be. Now, why that's significant is the following, and then I'll close. That that spend represents a 50% increase in what the non-identified LGBTQ customer was. So I think that speaks for itself in terms of the spend for this business. And in closing, I will tell you that we are committed, just like the Senator's committed to get that bill passed, and thank you, Senator, for your leadership, because he's right, it's a nonpartisan issue. It's not an R attached to it, it's not a D, it's not an I, it's not an L. There's nothing attached. It's an issue of humanity, and it's an issue that's the right thing to do. And I cannot think again of another time more important than in 2016 with all the atrocities happening in this world, that we have to stand up for what we believe in and do the right thing. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank you Rudy, or Ray, or Carlos. Um, and you know, hearing all of those statistics about how LGBT Broward County is, I want to thank everybody in the room for helping make it that way by being so LGBT yourselves, many of you. Um, before I bring up our final speaker, I just want to remind folks who are interested in your company getting cutting edge training, diversity training on LGBT issues and in particular transgender issues in the workplace that Gina Duncan is an amazing resource we have with us here in Florida and you have this uh, flyer so be sure to check in with her afterwards. So for our final speaker I'm going to bring back up our sponsor we're so thrilled to have with us um, and you know in addition to sponsoring today Suzanne, is a uh, Suzanne Bogdan is a managing partner at Fisher Phillips leads their employment discrimination work. So she really understands what is behind this. You know, the, we, we're talking about um, all of the pluses, but at the end of the day, this is also about people who really do lose their jobs or are too afraid to come out at work or have a change in management that leaves them hitting a glass ceiling they never thought they were gonna run into. And Suzanne is one of the people those folks turn to and she's gonna close us out, thank you. Okay, well, I know we're getting a little late in the day, and you've heard some of the issues that deal with the legal aspects of workplace diversity law. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what the status of the law is so that you can understand not only on the state level, but there are other areas too where there's still work to be done to increase those protections. So in the federal level, from the federal law standpoint, there is no protection in the statutory or constitutional law that would protect LGBT, sexual orientation, gender identity, anything, any of those rights. And so what's happened is, uh, well, by the way, there has been a law that's pending for about 10 years called ENDA, uh, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, and it has not passed. It's come up and it's come up and it's come up and it has not passed. Um, what has happened in the meantime then is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, this is the agency from the federal level that enforces non-discrimination rights, they have basically taken the position that Title VII, Title VII is the law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, religion, national origin, those types of things. They've taken the position that sex in that law means gender, means gender identity and sexual orientation. And so one of their agenda items for movement in the law has been, since 2012, uh, has been to move LGBT rights forward and to bring cases. And they have brought a lot of cases, they've gotten a lot of settlements, 
They have continued to get lower courts to agree with them that LGBT rights are covered under this law. But at the same time, there are a fair number of lower courts that don't agree. So what you have, if remembering back to same-sex marriage issues, you have the same kind of patchwork of laws that are working their way through the courts and the appellate courts, and eventually it's going to end at the Supreme Court. And there will be a decision at some point whether or not Title VII includes LGBT rights. You know, the other route to that, because there's an uncertainty that is there, is to continue with the good work that Equality Florida and other organizations are doing to lobby for ENDA or some other federal law that will secure those rights from a federal standpoint. And why is that important? It's important for some of the reasons we discussed today. People move from state to state. They move from job to job. And right now, there's nothing that is consistent across the United States or across Florida from a non-discrimination for LGBT areas. The other thing that you know, is there that we discussed a little bit is local laws. So right now, throughout Florida, there are a number of cities and counties you know, that have various types of local laws that protect um, LGBT rights. But what you also need to know is while they're very strong in Broward, Miami-Dade, Palm Beach County, where probably most of us live and work, there, many of the laws only protect public employees. So there are a lot of areas in Florida that private employees that work for the small businesses have no protections. And so that, again, is another one of the reasons why there is a very strong reason to continue with legislative efforts. So, you know, as we look forward, you know, the other thing you need to remember is I've told you that the EEOC is doing a really good job on moving this law forward. I don't know what would happen if Donald Trump became president, you know. I don't know what will happen with the EEOC and their funding and their mandates to move this forward. So as we you know, stand here today, you've got a wonderful organization that supported you know, the law that was attempted to be passed in Florida to expand the civil rights. And it's important to continue with all of those good lobbying efforts to see if we can't get national and state laws that are consistent on these areas. So thank you very much.